We are uh, learning Parsha's Truma today. And there's sheets uh, put out on the tables. If you need sheets to follow along, uh, they are there. We're now entering the month of Ador. And we are less than two weeks away from Purim. So we want to start uh, combining the themes of the Parshios and uh, with Ador and specifically Purim. Any of the Parshas we read in the month of Ador must be intimately connected to the theme of Purim and to everything that Ador is all about. So that's one thing we're going to be cognizant of today. Okay, the, uh, the first issue I want to talk about and it's something we talked about in the book of Reishis a little bit. Now we're going to talk about it here as well. And that idea being, we are now seven parshas into the book of Sefer Shmos. Now, what is the Talmudic name for the book of Shmos? We know that each one of the five books of the Torah has the book that it says in the Torah what it's called, Reishis Shmos, Vayikra, Amid Bortvarm. And then there is the, the name, how it's referenced in the Talmud, the thematic understanding of the book. So, for example, Breshis thematically is called what? Sefer Hayitzira, the book of creation. It's called the book of creation. So then the question had to be asked, well, creation was only the first chapter. So why is the whole book called the book of creation? The answer is there was creation going on in all 50 chapters. And the patriarchs were creating the spiritual characteristics necessary to create the foundation of the Jewish people. So that's a discussion on its own right, not for now. But that's the idea of the book of creation. So now what is the book of Shmos called? What's the Talmudic reference? Sefer Shmos, Shmos just means names. But what is the Talmudic reference of the Sefer? So it is called the Sefer Golus Uga'ula, the book of exile and redemption. That's what the book of Shmos, all the Parshas, again, it's one book. It's called the book of exile and redemption. So you start in the beginning. We've already gone through. Parsha Shmos talks about the exile, the beginning prophecy of the redemption, but no redemption. Then we move on to Ba'era, Ba'era, Bo, Beshalach. That's the real redemption. We then move on to Parshish Yisro, the giving of the Torah. Well, we know there are four cups of wine and there were four expressions of redemption. And the fourth expression is that God takes us unto him for a people. So getting the Torah at Sinai is also part of that redemption. And we can even take Parshish Mishpatim and say that's an elaboration of that which was given at Sinai. We could stretch it to Mishpatim. So with the first six parshas, we could certainly say it is the book of exile and redemption. Now we begin the next five, the final five parshas of the Torah, which talk about building the Mishkan, talk building the tabernacle. Where does that fit into the concept of redemption? We are already redeemed. The four expressions of redemption have been realized. So what redemption is left? And if anything, what would be the better place to put these five parshas, the building in Mishkan? Put it in the next part, book, the book of Ayikra, which talks about the animal offerings. So you're going to talk about all the animal offerings, so let's talk about building the Mishkan where the animals were offered. So put that all into the book of Ayikra. So just like we asked a number of weeks ago, what were the first stories of the Parsha of Shmos doing in Shmos? Why was it in Bracious, if you recall? So we're asking the reverse. Why the last Parshas in Shmos? In Shmos, it should be by Yikra. We already are redeemed. So that question we'll get to in about an hour. And then you'll know we're almost over. Uh, an, another question again is, what is the intimate connections of these Parshas to Ador and Purim? And if we are talking about building the Mishkan, and we are talking about the Mishkan was, uh, what do you call it, an, an itinerant uh, sanctuary. Itinerary, right? Is that the word? No, it's itinerant. Mm -hmm. You're the English teacher, right? So, <laughs> the an iti itinerant sanctuary that moved along with the Jews. And it lasted for the 40 years the Jews were in the desert. 
369 years when they were in the land of Canaan. Then, uh, then finally we built the first temple, second temple. So what's the difference in a Mishkan and a Mikdash? What's the difference in a tabernacle? It's a terrible English word. I, I would never call it that, but that's what the English calls it, a tabernacle. The Mishkan was the temporary house. We'll call it a Mishkan. Temporary house where Hashem resided in. It would be taken up, put down, taken up, put down. Uh, and, then, and the base on Mikdash, the sanctuary, what is the essential difference between a Mishkan and a Mikdash and what does it have to do with our lives? This is all like ancient stuff. A Mishkan over there. Like, what, what does it have to do with us? Now, let's look at the first source. We'll talk a little bit about Purim. The Rambam says that when Mashiach comes, all the books of the prophets and the Keshuvim in the future will will not be around anymore. They'll cease. We still have the five books of Moses that we need and the oral laws that we need because we need to know how to live, etc., etc. But all the books that are prophets and the writings, the Nevi'im and the Ksuvim will no longer exist. How could it not exist? It will but not be necessary. No, but you're, you're not getting any new laws from the prophets. But it's, it's, it's not necessary anymore. It will have no, it will service no value for the type of life that we live at that time. I've, I've, I always thought that once um, the Shia comes, that everybody will know everything before and they won't have to. They know the laws. Uh, we, we will, uh, we will, we will the question is what will we, yeah, but the question is what will we know and what will we not need to know? What will we not need to know? So it seems that the Rama is saying we don't need to know anything about the prophets and the Ksuvim anymore. Except for one thing. He says, the days of Purim will never cease. That we will always have. Because it says in the Megillah, and these days of Purim shall never cease among the Jews, nor shall their remembrance perish from their descendants. So we see in the Megillah it says that this story will never cease and it's something that needs to be learned and studied it will be something that will constantly be with us. So the obvious question is why? What makes this so unique? Okay, so now let's do a little bit of study for a few minutes, get a little bit detailed just for a few minutes. The differences between the Mishkan and the Mikdosh. The Mishkan, the temporary temple the Mikdash, the permanent temple. And to this we have two sources, number two and number three. The, the, second, the second source is at the end of Sefer Shmos, when the, when the Mishkan was finally finished. And the next source is in the Book of Kings, when we're dealing when the Beis Mikdash was finally finished. So I wrote it in Hebrew and in English. And let's see if we can find at least two major differences that the texts tell us between the Mishkan and the Mikdash. It says at the end of Sefer Shmos, as the Mishkan was finished, it says, Ki anan Hashem ala Mishkan yomam, for a cloud of Hashem was on top of the Mishkan in the day, for Eish and a fire, Tealai Labo, would be on top of it at night. Le'enei kol Yisrael, before the, all the eyes of the Jewish people, b'chol ma'asem in all their journeys. That is the Mishkan. The Beis HaMikdosh, the third source, the Book of Kings, it says, "Vayihi b'tzei sakwanim min amikodesh." When the Kohanim left the holy sanctuary, ve'anon molei es beis Hashem, and the cloud of Hashem filled the house of God. Lo yachlu akohanim lamod lisharis v'anon, and the Kohanim could not stand to serve in there because of that cloud. Ki molei chvod Hashem es beis Hashem, because the glory of Hashem filled the entire house of Hashem. So there are two major differences you see between the Mishkan and the Mikdash. Difference number one, the Mishkan, there was an Anan, a cloud in the day, and a fire at night, indicating the presence of the Shekhinah of God. By the base of Mikdash, there was no indication of any fire. There was no fire there indicating God's presence. Why? Question number one. Question number two, the Mishkan, the Anand, the cloud of the day and the fire at night, where was it? It says, Al, oh, it was above the Mishkan, on top of it, in plain sight of the Jewish people. 
it was above. Right. The manifestation of the Shekhinah was above, but in the base of Midi, it says the Anan filled the base of Shem. It was within, it was inside. So we see two differences. The Mishkan had the fire at night, the base of Migdash didn't. And the Mishkan had the cloud of glory and the fire on top of the Mishkan. Le'ene kol Yisrael, in the sight of the Jewish people, while the Mikdash, it was inside. So these aren't small things. So this teaches us now the essential difference between the Mishkan and the Mikdash. And we'll have to see what that difference is and how that's relevant for us. And to appreciate it, there's a beautiful medrash in the fourth source. And it's on this parsha. And it's on the first verse, second verse, which says, Hashem tells Moshe, V'yikhuli truma. And take for me truma. Tell the Jewish people to take for me truma, an offering. Now, of course, everyone notices a problem with the language. You don't take a gift you give a gift. You say, okay, go and, 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 and take take from me a gift. No, give from me a gift. It should say, the eat newly truma. Why does it say, and take from me a gift? So he brings a number of verses in, from Tanakh in Song of Songs where he says the following. And it's all in English uh, in the fourth source, starting with a verse from Song of Songs, chapter 5. Where it says there, Ani yesheina v'libi er. I am asleep, but my heart is awake. What does that mean? So the Medrash references this. This is the Jewish people speaking. And they're speaking after the sin of the golden calf, which we'll get to in a couple weeks. And says, I'm asleep, but my heart's awake. Yashanta li I have fallen asleep from ever hoping that the redemption will come. In other words, I've given up hope on myself of there ever being a redemption. You know, in other words, they kind of are feeling there's not going to be a happy ending to this story. We sin with the sin of the golden calf, which we've said in the past, the Medrash compares this to a, a kala, a bride, who's waiting for the wedding, and right before she goes to the wedding canopy, what happens is she decides to have an affair with an old flame. Right, it's a pretty bad thing. It's pretty bad for the husband to forgive her for that. Same thing, Hashem at Sinai was the chuppah, and like right, right after the chuppah, like Mamish there, they saw him fooling around with the calf. Very bad sin. And the Jews felt it was such a bad sin, you can't recover from this. They, they knew how bad it was. So they're kind of saying, we're asleep from the redemption. Like, we're, it's, it's not, it's not going to work out good anymore. That's what the Jews felt. Medrash goes on. El HaKadosh Baruch Er. So the Jewish people say, I'm asleep. But Hashem says, but my heart's alive. I'm awake. Hashem says, there's still hope. I'm not giving up hope. The Jewish people were saying, I was asleep because I'm in a state of despair from the sin of the golden calf. If you leave the air, my heart's aroused. Meaning Hashem. Hashem is knocking upon the doors. Hashem's knocking upon our hearts. To which the Medrash says, ah, that's what it means. The truma. Take for me Truma. Hashem says, gather up Truma, build a Mishkan, and even though you thought Hashem doesn't want to have anything to do with you, Hashem gave us a mitzvah to build the Mishkan. And that means, V'yikuli, I want you to take me. I want you to take me. By giving the offerings, you will take me. But I will, I'm allowing myself to be brought back into your life. And you can take me by giving this offering. And that's what it says, and build for me a sanctuary and I will dwell amongst you. He brings other verses in Song of Songs, how my beloved knocks at the door and says, please open it up for me, my sister, my beloved. How long does Hashem have to go around without having a house to live in? Well, how long is my head going to be filled with dew? Rather make for me a migdash and I won't have to stand on the outside anymore. That's what the Medrash says. So Hashem is saying, how long can I go around the universe without a home? And this is the concept of the Mishkan. The Mishkan really is representing the atonement for the sin of the golden calf. And, uh, and Hashem wants to be with us. We thought He doesn't want to have anything to do with us. So Hashem wants to be with us. So what the point is from this Medrash is the Mishkan was primarily coming as a way to correct 
the problem of the sin of the golden calf. To repair the damage of the sin of the golden calf. You fell into a sin of the golden calf. So I want you to build a mishkan. That's the Medrash is clearly showing. The Jews were in despair. There's no more relation, nothing going on. Hashem says, no, build me a mishkan, it'll be fine. So if the mishkan is the medicine, if the mishkan is fixing things up, so what was the problem? What was the problem with the sin of the golden calf that the Mishkan is fixing up? The Mishkan is repairing the damage of the golden calf. What was the damage of the golden calf? From which we are told that there isn't any suffering in this world till today that doesn't come from the original sin of the golden calf. So what is this all about? So we look in the fifth source, the first principle of Jewish belief. And it's one that many of us struggle with. An imamim bemuna shalema, I believe with a complete faith. Shabari is Shmo that the Almighty, who bore umanhig, who bore, he is a creator, umanhig, and he directs and he guides lechol haburuim everything in creation. Vahu lavado and he alone osa vaosa v'yasu lechol masim. He alone do, did, does, and will continue to do everything that's in this world. What is this first principle teaching us? It's teaching us that to be a Jew means you have to believe that not only is Hashem the creator, that he made the world. And this, this is where we get into very um, um, uncomfortable territory when you start talking about Jews and their belief in Hashem. Many Jews will say, and even non-Jews will say, I believe in God. I believe in God. 100% believe in God. Right? The question is, well, what do you believe in? It's a nice word, God. What does that mean? So the 13 principles of Jewish belief define what it means. If you say I'm a Jew and believes in God, those are 13 principles. You have to accept them. If you don't, then you don't believe in the God the way God is. You believe in another deity, but it's not Hashem. So the first message, and probably the most difficult message, is people might believe that Hashem created the world. Eh, 6,000 years ago, going to create the world? Okay, I can live with that. That doesn't bother me any. But what bothers everybody a lot is that next word, umanhig, he directs everything. Okay. To be a Jew means, not only do you believe that Hashem is a creator, but he, he creates, he guides, and he leads the world. And every situation that exists in this world is tailor-made with his infinite wisdom to challenge us or whatever comes our way. Now this has tremendous ramifications that obviously people are going to have a lot of difficulties with. But that's what the principle says. If, if there's a creator, it's, it's not just there some of the time. He's there all of the time. There's nothing in this world he's not aware of, nothing in this world that he's not powerful enough to do or to stop. There's no way. If you believe, if you believe he created the world, tell me, tell me how, how did he create the world? I have no idea. Can you create the world? No. We wouldn't even begin to know how to begin to create a world. So the infinite genius who created the world created everything that is going on in this world because everything that came in from creation comes on loan from his power anyway. So this, this and I, we don't have time, we'd have to go through uh, many teachings in the Chovas Alvavas to spend hours and hours proving this point. That's not the point of this class. The point of this class is we're, we're, go we're going with that given. It's a given. If you have questions, another class for another time. But this is a given. So now this idea was the mistake of the Jewish people with the golden calf. When the Jewish people threw the gold in and out came a calf and what did they say? This is your God of the Jewish people. Who took you out of Egypt. What was going on over there? Is the main problem with our belief was not whether Hashem created the world. That wasn't the problem with the golden calf. The fact that he is the manhig he is the one who's in control, that which made us very uncomfortable. Which means to say that by Sinai, the Jewish people clearly saw he was the creator. There is no question. We say in the book of Dvarim, Atah you were made to be you were made to know that I am the creator and I am God. And Hashem showed himself in the most vivid way possible. They said what was seen was heard, and what was heard was seen. They saw things with an impeccable clarity that there is a God who created the world. There is a God. They saw the miracles of going out of Egypt. They saw that God controls nature. He controls everything. Can't argue that. 
But then there's the second issue, Hanhaga, direction, leading. And that there was a problem. When Moshe was gone and the people thought he was dead, mistakenly thought he was dead, they said, Vizeh Ha'ish Moshe in the sixth source. It says they saw he was delayed in coming. And he said, This man, Moshe, Liadanu Mahayulo, we don't know what happened to the guy. So although they believed that Hashem was the creator, they had not yet come to terms with the belief that he's mamish involved in every single thing in your life. And that Hashem does not need to have a Moshe Rabbeinu. That Hashem can lead every aspect of your life even without a Moshe Rabbeinu. But when they saw that Moshe was gone, they thought that the agent of Hashem was gone. And therefore their mistake was, Hashem is great, Hashem is powerful. And Moshe is great enough to be our go-between. But without him, we have to appoint something else. Something whereby Hashem's blessings will find a place in this lowly world through this new agent that we have. You know, it's not uncommon for people to find, uh, you find people who idolize uh, their Rebbes or they idolize Sadiqim more than they idolize Hashem. It's not unusual. They revere holy people. It's more tangible to them. They feel closer. More than they revere Hashem. Also we find people who admire people that even aren't worthy of, of, of idolization. And they do that a lot more than they idolize Hashem. So when Moshe is gone, the Jewish people have a difficult situation. They have, and they believe, there is a creator way beyond any level we could understand there's a creator. But the problem they feel is he's not connecting to us because Moshe was our connection. So they felt they needed this medium from which Hashem's blessing could pour down upon them. They felt they needed something else to take care of us on behalf of Hashem in this world. So what's the problem? What was the sin? So the sin of the golden calf was that they believed as Hashem is the creator who's capable of amazing things, but we're not on a level to have direct access to this. We need a mediative power to absorb the heavenly energies and to transfer this to this lowly, miserable world that we live in. So the problem they had was seeing Hashem as a manhig, being intimately involved in every single thing that was happening in our lives. That was the problem that we had. So now after they had that sin, the Jewish people fell asleep, as it were, the Medrash saying, in a despair. They felt despair. They said, we have, no, we have no connection with God. Forget it. So Hashem offers and challenges the Jewish people and says, I don't want to be outside your lives. You know, you, know, you have parents, you have kids uh, in university far away and um, you know, the parents, what is it that the parents want and what is it that the kids want? The kids say, Dad, everything's great, university, please send the check. And the father says, I'd like to see you. He says, no, I'm really busy, just send the check. And uh, they would prefer to have the check than the parents. But don't, the parent wants to see the kid, the kid couldn't care less to see the parent. Just give me what I need. Right now I need to pay the next rent in university and there's a lot of fees coming for books and this and that, etc., etc. Just send me the check and I'll be happy and I don't really have to see you, I'm very busy. So after this terrible failure of not being able to feel Hashem in their lives down here on this earth, they felt that, th that there's no relationship with Hashem. So Hashem says, no! Kol do di do the, 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 the knocking of my beloved is, is making a sound and saying, open the door for me, my beloved. Make it open. Make for me a mishkan. I don't want to be outside your lives. And here is the most profound idea. Hashem does not want to be a distant theological concept in your mind. This idea that there's a God and he's very far away. He's way over there. And I don't really know him very much. Frankly, if he doesn't bother me, I, don't want to, I won't bother him. 
and once in a while I'll need something, I'll send a message, I'll go to Atzadik, Atzadik will pray, somehow they'll send a care package from heaven, it'll land here, and I'm very happy to have what the care package has, but God, you know, you're very far away. Dad, send the check. You know, and when you die, I'll come to the funeral. You know, and I hope you cut me in the will. You know, so the executor will give you the money. Right? This distant relationship. And don't, don't be fooled. The fact that people have very distant, generally have distant relationships with their parents because they have a distant relationship with their father in heaven. There's, there's, there's a lot of similarities to that. Hashem says, I'm not that. I want you to let me in. Let me into your lives. Build a mishkan. Mishkan's words for shachan, to dwell. The purpose of creation, why did God create the world, is that the Shekhinah should dwell in this world and should be part of our lives. So the key to, the key to the, why God created the world wasn't for the creation of the world. It was for this idea of this hanhaga, of this direction in which we have an intimate relationship with Hashem. And uh, similarly, parents, you know, having a child isn't the goal for a parent. It's having a person to nurture, to develop, to have a relationship with the child. We don't have kids just to have kids. We have kids that should become part of our lives and we should be part of their lives. And that's what Hashem is saying. I created the world to be part of your life. It is the most pleasurable thing to have me part of your life. The Jewish people thought, no, there's this God. He's far away, he's powerful, he's this and that. But really, the day-to-day -day activities, we can really handle by ourselves. Get us a good leader like Moshe, he'll take care of 99% of what we need. Once in a while, the, the enemies are going to obliterate us. We'll have him pray to you. You'll send a miracle here and there. Fine, stay far away from us. You're a good, rich relative to have far away. But I don't have to sit with you, and it's not necessary. I may not feel worthy for this, or I just find it too overwhelming to have this godly presence so intimately involved in my life. Do you understand? Do you follow? Do you follow? That's what the Jewish people were suffering from. And Hashem says, no, the cure is you have to have a mishkan. You have to have a mishkan. So now, what's the point of the mishkan? And this point is as relevant today as it was 3,000 years ago. The Mishkan is coming to repair and correct the damage of the distorted view that the Jews had of God as manifest through the sin of the golden calf. And therefore, they thought God was distant. So what does Hashem have to show them? He's not distant. And He wants to be very close. So He says, go build a Mishkan. And therefore, when you, have to, you build this Mishkan, then what happens? Comes this cloud of glory which they know is the manifestation of Hashem. And where is it? On the top of a very faraway mountain? Where is it? It's right on top of the Mishkan. As the puzzle says, Le'ene kol Yisrael, before the eyes of the Jewish people. Every Jew will see that Hashem's presence is smack in downtown Mishkanville. Okay? Hashem is with all of them, not just with the Kohanim, not just with the holy people. He's with everybody. They need no mediums. Hashem is enough. Hashem is everything. So that's because we are on top of the Mishkan. No doubt. You see it clear as day. Why do they need a fire at night? Well, something very interesting. The Jews were in the desert. Now, the desert is symbolic of something. The desert, what, what is in the desert? Nothing. A vast, immense, space of nothingness. I mean, like nothing grows there. I mean, in a real desert. I mean, the real desert desert, okay? There's nothing that grows there. It's, there's nothing more desolate than that. That's symbolic of Hester Punim, of when God, as it were, hides his presence from us. That's what it's symbolic of. It's a place of nightfulness, a place of tumma, a place of impurity, it's described as a place of wild beasts, danger, death that awaits you. Whenever you think of an idea of a desert, you don't get warm and fuzzy feelings. A romantic vacation to the desert of Sahara, you don't, you don't advertise that. There's nothing pleasant about the desert. It's only negative. Your greatest fear is to be stuck in a desert alone. It's terrible. It's death. Well, here's, here's the vort. Sometimes a person can feel that he is going through a desert time in his life. 
where it seems that the desert-like forces of evil have taken over your life and Hashem is concealed and Hashem is hidden and you feel as desolate as a desert and as empty of godliness as a desert appears to be and as distant from God as a desert would appear to be and when that happens you understand what I'm talking about you know having big challenges is, uh, I see God's not with me God doesn't appear to be with me and that's when a person is most likely to think that maybe there's something else that runs his life or might be better to choose something else to run your life because you don't think that God is running your life anymore maybe there's another way that I have to live and maybe it's not with Hashem why? because I don't see myself being so successful with Hashem right? I, I'm religious and I don't have a job and I can't pay the, the school tuitions or whatever problems we have right? The, we have these midbor like experiences, these desert-like experiences where a person is going through their own personal desolation and there's more of a likelihood of falling into terrible despair and throwing away Judaism and losing one's emunah and because there doesn't seem to be a relationship between your personal success or lack of success and the presence or absence of Hashem in your life that doesn't, there's no connection an opposite. Oh, you see, all your non-religious friends are doing much better than you. They are, you know, going shopping on Shabbos and playing golf on Shabbos and they seem to have all the money to go on all the vacations. And you're the religious one trying to be a real Jew and you're living in the desert with no success. So during that time, you could make a cheta egel mistake. You could make a golden calf mistake you're very vulnerable that's when the Jews sinned they were in a desert don't forget they, you know, it wasn't like they were sitting the golden calf in the middle of Yerushalayim it was a desert where death was all around them and now Moshe Rabbeinu the only thing they were holding on to was gone she could understand desperate people do desperate things so there was a writer oh, um, there was a secular Jewish writer who later became observant and he wrote about the Holocaust and he describes in one story a scene of a young boy young Jewish boy who was smuggling food into the ghetto which you know was a terrible crime so they caught this young child and the child was going to be publicly executed going to be hung in, and everybody has to go everyone has to look at it to learn to be afraid so this writer mentions there was a uh, people, everyone was looking there so a secular Jew leaned over to a religious Jew and said to him, as the child's hanged, so tell me, where is God now? Right? And there's many stories like that. Many people give this idea, you know, after what happened in the Holocaust, where, where could there be God? So, it's just an example where everybody goes through a midbor like experience. You go through a certain experience where you feel totally desolate, and there's nothing there, and Hashem isn't there. And if, 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 and if what you want is taken away from you, you feel like you're in a desert, even if you're living in a beautiful palace. You know, you could have a person who has lots of money and a fancy house and a fancy car and everything, but, uh, you know, one day the person's spouse says, you know, I found someone else. So you say, I don't understand. I thought when we got married you said we'll, we'd live happily ever after. So she says, yeah, but now it's after. It's after. <laughs> so so we don't have a relationship anymore. And, and that person can feel such a darkness, the darkness of the desert, you know, even, even if there's lots of people around, and even if there's a lot of things going on, there's this own empty darkness you have, and that is the prime time to fall into a sin of the golden calf, where it's not merely idolatry, it means to start to indulge in certain things that you shouldn't be indulging in. And you say like this, the psychology works like this. And, I, and I've seen this. I mean, I, you know, I once got an email from somebody who was, who was, a, who was a Baal Tshuva and this person was, was, you know, had put their life in order and got married and this and that. And all of a sudden things weren't going that person's way. And such an about face just talk about how terrible God is and, and this and that the person wanted a couple things and God wasn't giving it to them 
and say this is not this is not a, a good religion this is this and then all these terrible things and and basically the, what what the person is saying they may not know they're saying but they're really saying this they're saying you know what Hashem really doesn't run my life because if he did the things would be better right because obviously no one knows it better than me how it should be right so it's not the way I want it then God is not running my life so it must be something else is running my life I don't know what but it isn't God and therefore in the meantime I don't have to listen to what God says and I may as well you know catch up on my partying and all the things I used to do in a previous lifetime, I might as well go back to it. Because at least, at least if God would be, would be running my life, that would be okay. But if for God to run my life, then everything should be in order. If it's not in order, he obviously is not running my life. So it comes out in indulging. And that's what the sin golden calf brought them out to. It brought them to licentiousness. That's really what it was get, getting to come out. And that's really the bottom line. People say they don't believe in God. They just want to justify their behaviors that they want to do. And that's what's happening. And that, that's, that, that, but, but that's when you're in that desert-like world. And, uh, and we live in a world today that's full of complaints. Most people you speak to, religious or not religious, they're all complaining. Most. The vast majority. A couple people don't complain. But everybody has what to complain about. Whatever it is. Don't have enough money. Everybody doesn't have enough money. Right? And, 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 and the vacations aren't good anymore and uh, the schools aren't good and, and they're having trouble this one's having trouble finding a shidduch and then when this one gets married then they have a trouble with the one that they married and this one's having trouble having kids and then they have kids and they're having trouble with the kids that they do have and uh, you know I was, I was speaking to somebody and was saying that the uh, person was having issues they would need to have a shidduch she's an older woman she's having a shidduch this and that and I said I said, and what's going to be when you, when you have a shidduch? She says, what do you mean? I said, so what's going to be the next thing you're going to complain about? She said, what do you mean? She says, I promise you you're going to complain about the next thing. What do you mean? I'm going to be very happy. All I am lonely. And if I would get married, I would not be lonely. And that's all I want is to not be lonely. I guess they don't know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Or Kohlberg's. And we know that as soon as you have what you want, you need the next thing. This for sure. I said, and what's gonna I said, and what's gonna be after you get married? And God will not give you children right away. I won't see you back in this office complaining how God is all I want now is a child. And then he will give you a child. And then you're gonna say, Well, all I want is two children. Right? And then you have the two children. And then the kid is not doing so good in school. Then you're gonna he says, you got to understand, life, one of the biggest lessons in life, there's no such thing as things the way you want it. That's because, because you know what, God knows better what we want, what we need. And that's what life is, going from one situation to the next situation. Everyone says, if I just get by this, then everything's going to be fine. God says, there's no such creation. You know, there's only one place where everything's fine, and that's after you're dead in the world of souls. As long as you're here, you're here to work hard. And that's what life is, and that's for our best, it's our best interest. As it says in the book of Job, man was created to work hard, not to vacation and relax. No, you can't, in a, you, to rest, to continue to get back to the hard work of being a good Jew and living in God's world. But you've got to realize that, that that's where Hashem set up the world. So people are filled with complaints, and it manifests itself in golden calves. We make different golden calves in our lives because we really don't understand how God is really involved in everything. If God was involved, why wouldn't I be married by now? God wants to get married. So it must be he's not running my life. He's not running my life. So what do I have to keep the Shabbos for? What do I got to keep this kosher for? It doesn't make any difference. That, that you have to have a, a Muna that even if it's not going the way you want it, he is more, see the problem we have is we don't know, and we'll see in a minute, that God loves us more than we love ourselves. Because we only want a quick fix, but we don't really love ourselves. We don't care about what's going to happen to us later. God worries about what our eternal existence is going to be. We're so short-sighted, we don't love, we can't believe anyone could love us more than, he could, than, than we love ourselves. And that's where you, you, that's the, so Bore is wanting, but Manhig is the next. He's really directing every little thing, everything's important. So Dafka in the Mishkan, 
which is coming to repair the sin of the golden calf. So there had to be a fire at night. Why? To show that Hashem is saying clearly to you that I don't remove myself from you in the day, I don't remove myself at night, and at night it's the opposite. Hashem is mamish with us more than any other time. And I want you to see every day, 24-7, the cloud's there, and if the cloud's not there, the fire's there. And I'm there in the desert where you don't think there's nobody there to help you. I'm there all the time for you. And if things aren't going the way you want them, but you see I'm there. And that was the message he wanted to show them. 